there. The person you're calling isn't picking up. There's any number of reasons why they're not answering, but sometimes your mind goes to the dark place and you decide they've blocked your number. When you block a number, you no longer receive calls or texts from that number. iPhones take it a step even further by including FaceTime. So how can you tell if you've been blocked? Well, there isn't any kind of official notification, but you can make an educated guess by reading some tells. Your first tell is the radio silence. Calls and texts are going unanswered. It looks like the texts are getting received, but no reply. What gives? Huh? Well, if your number is blocked, those texts aren't getting delivered and those calls aren't ringing on the other end. Another big tell? The number of rings you hear before going to voicemail. If all you're hearing is a single ring before being directed to voicemail, then you've been blocked. An unusual number of rings doesn't mean anything particular, but if you're only getting the one, then voicemail, you've been blocked. Another tell, if you receive an automated message after making the call. It's not an absolute, but if you get a call along the lines of the customer you're trying to reach is unavailable, then there's a good chance you're never going to get through. There's other reasons you might be getting this message, but if you're getting this message every day, Okay, today, get ready. Um, there, as we've told you throughout this series, there's things that we can do in our lives that block us from God's blessings, from Him responding when we pray, when we go to Him, when we seek His face, when we cry out, and there's moments where we just can't feel Him, we can't hear Him, we feel like He's nowhere even close to where we're at. And there, there's just times when we feel blocked. Our prayers are blocked. There's things that we can do, and there's things that we don't do. And today, we're going to highlight three things, okay? And we, though there's more that we could preach about, there's more in the Word of God that talks about our prayers being blocked. We chose these three based on the fact that they're probably the most common that we think uh, we deal with, you know, things that we deal with. So, so we're going to bring to you three things today. And all three of these things that we can do or not do all hinge upon the idea of it being all about numero uno, me. It's all about me. And so we're going to dig in today. I I hope you're taking notes because this message is really going to bless you or block you. (laughs) All depends on how you receive it. Well, today, the first point that we're going to talk about, and don't put it up on the screen yet, all right? The first thing we're going to talk about is something that honestly affects each and every one of us, but it's an area that we definitely want to suppress. We don't want to really talk about it because it, it deals with where people have hurt us, all right? All of us in this room have had people say things to us that offended us. We've had people do things to us that were extremely painful, very hurtful. You know, the statistics are one out of every two couples who get married end in divorce court. So that means that one out of every two families has had extreme pain. You don't go to divorce without things being said and being done that cut you deeply. And if your children that are a product of that, then you've been affected. That's just one of the many areas that humanity has affected one another with pain. Okay, so today the very first point we're talking about is not something you've necessarily done that has blocked you, but something you have not done, and that is forgiven. Whether you realize it or not, unforgiveness in your heart will block you from God. It will block your prayers from God hearing and answering them. And I know you're not saying amen right now because it's tough. Because all of us have replayed those moments in our head like a movie. What they said goes over and over and over again. What they did over and over and over and over. And we somehow convince ourselves that the injustice that was done to us, we can't possibly forgive because if we do, we're like letting them off the hook. If we forgive them, we're letting them off the hook and they don't deserve to be let off the hook because of what they did. And we convince ourselves, well, just maybe if they would ever say they were sorry, maybe I could heal and forgive and get past it. But since they're such jerks and they're never going to say they're sorry, I'm going to hold on to it. Because I deserve to hold on to it. But yet we do that not realizing that the word of God makes it extremely clear that we are to forgive. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, if you have your word, it says this. But when you are praying first, say first. Can't get more clear than that. When you are praying first, forgive anyone. Who is anyone? Anyone. I mean, look around. 
anyone. It, it doesn't say, let me put some conditions on it. It says, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. See, what we like to do in our life is we come to God and we say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me for the things that I've done wrong. God, forgive me for the things that I said. Forgive me for the things that I've done. And we expect God to forgive us because God, in his word, says he's a loving God. And he's a good father. And you just know that Jesus died for your sins, so he's going to forgive you. But the very same God says that he can't forgive you if you're not willing to forgive someone else. See, we hold ourselves to a different standard than anyone else. And that kind of standard blocks us. So when we're praying, we wonder to ourselves, God, are you not listening? Do you not hear me? And he's saying, I do, but I don't respond to that. Because that person that you hate and that you're holding all that bitterness and unforgiveness towards, they're my child too. And I'm not proud of what they've done, but I also wasn't proud of what you did. But I forgave you. And so though it's really, really hard, it's really hard to swallow. We've got to get real with ourselves. We've got to realize that there's junk deep down that we need to ask God to bring about healing into our life in order for God to hear our prayers. I remember years ago when I was about 19 years old, I was in youth ministry. I was a youth pastor. And there was this couple, and they were very conniving and, and did a lot of things behind my back and to my face that were extremely hurtful. And I remember just growing more and more and more bitter and more and more cynical and more and more hate building up inside of me, all right? I was fine if they weren't around. But the second they walked through the doors of the church and I was on the platform speaking, there was something in the pit of my stomach that was like, ugh. It was like, can we not have an absent today? You know what I'm saying? You know, when they walk through the door and you see somebody's face and all you can then think about is what they did to you, what they said. And I kept dealing with this. It went on and on and on for months. And it was like rotting me from the inside out. At the same time, I was trying to do ministry. So what am I doing every day? I am reading my Bible every morning from five to six. I'm praying. I'm in my word. I'm praying, asking God to anoint me, asking God to allow me to minister to people. But every time this couple walks through the door, I couldn't stand them. All right. It was like every time there was something in the pit of my stomach. And I remember I got to the point where I was like, God, I know this cannot make you proud. I wasn't willing to even admit he wasn't hearing my prayers. I kept praying every day. But I knew it was wrong. And so I remember I was in a camp and I was actually a counselor. I was a worker at that camp. And I went down to the altar at the end of the service and people were exiting. And I had had it with this mess in my life. And I said, God, there's only one way past this, and it's just you healing me. And so I'm not getting up from this spot until this thing is done. Heal me. Take this away from me. I can't keep doing this. I hate them. But I wasn't even willing to admit it until that moment at an altar. And I said, God, I hate them. I really hate them. And how can I hate my brother and say the love of God is inside of me? Like you and me get to pick and choose who God loves. You see, we don't get to do that. He died for every single person. When he hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them for you know not what they do. He was talking about humanity who beat him 39 times, spat in his face, beat him in the face, all for what? So he could cover our sins. We don't get to pick and choose who God loves. And the same token, we don't get to pick and choose who we forgive if we want God to hear us. That day I stayed at that altar. You can give God a hand. Amen. That day at that altar, I stayed there for three hours. And it was like I, God just kind of took me to a whole nother place. And when I got up that night at about 1230 a.m., everybody was long gone. There was one person in the room making sure I didn't die or something. I don't know what they were doing. They were just there praying over me. I got up and I completely felt this thing lift. It was like, this is over. This is done. The hate is gone. The unforgiveness, it's gone. And I couldn't wait to see them. 
And that's how I knew it was gone because I was like, I just want to test this out. I just want to see their faces because every other time I'd seen them, there was just this nasty thing in the pit of my stomach. And I remember seeing them and not feeling that way. And honestly, I realized God had taken the hate right out of me. He brought healing and put love for me for those people who had done me wrong. And here's the thing. They never, ever said, I'm sorry. They never came back and said, man, we were jerks. I'm really sorry for the things that I said. I'm really sorry for the way that I treated you. That was wrong. Never did that happen. But guess what did happen? Healing happened in my life, and I became unblocked from God hearing my prayers because of the decision I made. And see, a lot of you, you're right now holding on to junk that happened to you in your childhood, and you feel like the injustice was so bad that you need to hold on to it. But what you don't realize is you're blocking not only your prayers, but also your future and your purpose and your destiny for which God has for you. You realize that the junk of the past, the enemy has got a clutch on you, and he's held you in bondage because you just won't let go and let God bring about healing in your life. So you have to make a decision today. To say, you know what, I'm done letting the junk of my past affect my future. I am done letting what someone said and what someone did, no matter how heinous and how bad it was, I am not going to allow that to block me from the favor and the blessings of God and God hearing and answering my prayers. We could have spent the entirety of today's message just on this alone. Because we know there's hurt in this house. But as your pastors, when we see... um, as Jesus sees, we, there's nothing we want more for you than to, for you to experience that freeing power of forgiveness. When you've held on to something for so many years, it begins to hold on to you. And, and it, it'll, it'll grip you by the throat. It will own you. But the only reason it owns you is because you've given it permission to. This is not about the other person. This is about you. This is about you giving it up and giving it to God, and saying, I can't control that person. I can't control what they did. I can't change the past, but God, I can give it to you. I can give it to you, and you can take this off of me, just like he did with Misty. God, I believe that you can completely heal me of the hurt. I believe you can heal me of the, of the pain and the frustration and the bitterness, because the reality is, you hold on to that long enough, and that thing is going to fester that thing is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to become a cancer inside of you. It's going to eat you from, your, from the inside out of your spirit. It will right. eat you alive, and there's nothing more the enemy wants than for you to, to just get eaten up with that cancer of unforgiveness. And that unforgiveness works its way into our marriages. Yeah, and, and, and men, I want to talk to you just for a moment. The men of the house, I want to talk to you for a moment because so oftentimes... We can be just going to God with everything we've got. You can just be praying and just pouring your heart out to God and asking him to hear you, asking him to bless you, asking him to respond in all the various different situations that we deal with. And the reality is that he just can't hear you because of the way you've treated your wife. This, is, this scripture that I'm about to share with you is the scripture that came to my mind when Misty and I just began brainstorming about this series. We thought this one for sure we want to share this one and talk about this because it's, it's so oftentimes um, overlooked and misunderstood. But, but there's a freeing sensation for men when you understand what the Word of God says regarding your marriage. So let's look at it. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, Husbands, dwell with them. Who's the them? It's our wives. With understanding. Say understanding. understanding. Give honor. Say honor. Honor. To your wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life your listen that your prayers may not be hindered another version says this husbands conduct your married lives with understanding although your wife may be weaker physically you should respect her as a fellow heir of the gift of life if you don't your prayers will be blocked say blocked Another version says your prayers won't get above your head. Like a vapor, like it just, just a wisp of thin air. It's, you pray it and then whew, it's gone. It doesn't even make it above your head. Why? Because of the way we have treated our wives. So, so why? What is this? Why does it feel like sometimes in our prayer life we're drowning 
And, and it's like, God, are, are, you, you're, the, you're supposed to be the lifeguard on duty, and you're like off duty. You're nowhere to be found. Throw me uh, a life ring. Throw me some water wings. Throw me something, because I feel like, spiritually, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like you're not listening. But the Word of God says that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So if we look at the promises of God, we know that he is always there. Even though you feel like you're drowning in your prayers and there's no response, he's sitting there. He's on standby. He's watching you waller. He's watching you... Why? Why is he going to sit there and just let you drown to death in your prayer life? Because of the way you've treated your wife. Listen, you get a good perspective of this when, when you think about the fact that you're messing with God's daughter. Now, I think about this. You, you mess, you're messing, you're messing with, with daddy's girl. You have to ask yourself, how have I been treating daddy's girl? Because how you treat God's girl will greatly affect how her father hears and responds to your prayers. You can be doing everything right, guys. Listen, you, you can be in a life group. You can be on the serve team. You can be returning the tithe. You can be in your word every day. You have a daily reading plan on you version. You can be highlighting scriptures, and you can be posting them and sharing them on social media. You can be doing all the right stuff. But if you're not trying to understand her and trying to honor her and trying to be the man that God has called you to be for her, prayers won't get above your head. Listen, um, how many, how many uh, daddies do we have in the room? You have a daddy's girl. You have a daddy's girl, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, you mess with my boys, hey, they can handle themselves. They're all right. Boys are all right, right? They can handle themselves. But you, you mess with a daddy's girl, and it's a little bit different. It, it's a little bit different. Um, now, if you have a daddy's girl, you, you know what I'm talking about. You would fight 10 men. You would fight 10 men to defend your daughter, to defend her honor, to protect her, to do whatever you have to do for your daughter, you would fight 10 men. I would fight 10 men. I might get my butt kicked. I might get my butt kicked, but I'm going to do everything within my power to take care of my girls. But so oftentimes, we will, we will treat our wives in a way that's inconsistent with what God expects, and yet then we go to our father for favors. Why would you mistreat a daddy's girl and then go to the front door and, and her dad answer and you ask her father for a favor? Come on, think about it. Why would you do that? Because you know the response is going to be, you stupid boy. <laughs> and then you, get, then you get two barrels right up your nostrils <laughs> like that. Right? It's like, what, do you, what, what, what planet were you born on that you mistreat my daughter and then you come into my yard asking me for a favor? I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to teach you a life lesson. <laughs> and you're going to thank me later. Right? That, man, God is crazy about his girls. Right. And, and as men, we have to understand that, that our wives, they are a gift from God. And, and, and God has blessed you with her, and he wants you to, let's check this out, understand her. How, how do you understand your wife? This is a question we've been asking ourselves for many generations. And I don't, I can't really say I have the answer for you this morning. I wish I did, but that'll be one of the questions I ask God when I get there. That'll be one of the first questions. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, understanding is about perspective, Right. And in order for, for us to understand her, we have to stand under her. That means, you know, honor is about elevation. Honor elevates. Honor lifts up. Honor builds up. We don't tear down. We don't disrespect. We, 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 don't, we don't break them down with words. We love them. We build them up. We encourage them. This is unconditional. Honor is unconditional. I know... It, I know that you want to say, you know, I will, I will honor her and I will respect her when she respects me. That's not how it works. It's not conditional. It's not about what she says or what she does or how she acts. It has, this is a you thing. It's this message. It's all about me. This is about you. It's not about her. 
And, and, and we're going to stand before God and give an account. We're going to be held responsible for how we treated our wives while we were here on this earth. There's a reason why God gave us the title husband. Because when you, when you look at it in the Latin, in the, in the original, in the Greek, it, it means house band. Husband comes from house band. So there's a great responsibility that comes with the title house band. Our responsibility is to, not only do we get under her and, 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 and elevate her and lift her up, but we also are called to come over. This isn't a, a lording over. This isn't a borrowing from your strength and from your power. We're stronger physically. It's not about lording yourself over her, but it's about protecting her with your words. It's about protecting her spiritually. It's about providing and being that protector of the home. House band. We have that responsibility. Now I want to I want to I want to just step out of this just for a second over here. This is a different sermon for a different Sunday, but I want to just take a sidestep just for a second. Women, you would make it a whole lot easier. <laughs> okay? Let me just just go to the word of God. <laughs> Scripture says it is it is better to dwell on a housetop on the roof by yourself than to dwell down there in that house with a nagging wife. And I so, I'm so tempted right now because I could really go on this big comedy spiel, a, a thousand things I could say right now, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep it serious. <laughs> but, but for real, we know when we've messed up. We don't need you to magnify the situation. And to, you're laughing. I'm not being, I'm not being funny. It's just we so don't need to live. be. You know we don't need it? to be reminded of how we screwed up. We, it, we don't need you to, to magnify the situation. We don't need you to remind us of it six months down the road after we've already dealt with it. We know when we've messed up. Okay, we, we know. But, but when, you, when you go on and on and on about it, it becomes nagging. And, 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 and though our respect for you is, is unconditional, it would make it so much easier, right, if, if you respected him, not because of how he's acted. He may have been borrowing strength from his position, all right? He may have been trying to, to be heard rather than hearing. He may care more about being heard and, and, and not care about what you have to say, but, but, but in, in the same respect, if you'll just honor him. Tell him what he has done right. Yeah. Men want to be respected, okay? We want to know that you recognize how hard we work. We want to, you to recognize when we, have, um, when we have done well. We want to know that you're proud of it. That's all we want, really. Honestly, we're, we're a very low-maintenance species. In, 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 on the spectrum of humanity, we just want to know that we're doing a good job. And that we're respected and, and that our, our hard work isn't in vain. And we just want to be respected. So I want to encourage you guys, men, men, if you will honor her, if you will build her up with your words, if you will love her, if you will protect her, and be the man of God, be the house band that you committed to being that day that you said I do, I'm telling you right now, your prayers are going to, like a rocket. And God is going to hear you because you married daddy's girl. Wow. Sometimes it's tough, right? You got to kind of move your feet back. In the first message, he talked about not being Hagatha. And as we went back, our, our daughters came in and they were like, good job, like fist bump. You know, there's nothing better. I'd rather my daughters or my sons say good job after a service than anybody else. And they came in and they said, man, you guys did good. You know, I'm like, that's awesome because they're 14 and they were listening. And they said, um, dad, did you ever date a Hagatha? And I said, hmm, I don't know. We didn't really date very long. <laughs> so and I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow, right? And then, and then one of the girls said, honor, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, God lays it out so, so clearly. Let's go shopping. Each of our roles and our positions. And although this is not a marriage series, if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, go home and do it as your homework. E Ephesians chapter 5, it's going to tell you very clearly husband's roles and wife's roles. And if you'll both... Worry about yourself and follow the rules that God set out for you. Play your role. 
you will have an unimaginable marriage that people in the world will look at and say, I don't understand because they don't understand it. Because when you are doing exactly what God has called you to do, you're going to realize that he meshes you together, that covenant together. Now we're going to move on to number three as we're wrapping up this series. And it's simply this. You're going to be blocked when you're praying prayers that are not according to God's will. This is a tough one. This could have been a, a message all in itself, but we're going to wrap it up in the next five minutes. It says this in 1 John 5 and 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. I love that. This is the confidence we have. You know what it is to have confidence, to feel like you're being able to be heard. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 5, and if, he, if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked him for. Now listen, I get it. This is tough. You're like, okay, that makes total sense. If I ask according to God's will, how in the world am I supposed to know what God's will is? This is a mystery, right? Well, first of all, let me tell you, it's very black and white on some things. If you open this thing, You'll begin to realize that God clearly tells us what to do and not to do. That's clearly his will. And sometimes we're praying about something and he's like, I'm not going to answer you because can I be honest here? You haven't even read it. Like I already wrote it. Why am I going to say it again? All right. I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really like liking this guy. Like I'm thinking about dating him. And I'm like, here's my first question. And it will always be my first question. Does he love Jesus? Does he love Jesus? Well, I mean, he, I, I think he believes in God. It's not what I ask. I ask, does he have a relationship with Jesus? Because did you know the word of God says to not be unequally yoked? So how can you expect God to bless something that you've completely gone against his will on? I had somebody one time ask me, multiple times actually, but I remember one in particular, and they said, hey, listen, we're like, we've been dating for a long time. We really are ready to go to that next level, Okay. In my mind, I'm thinking that next step would be getting engaged, and then you're going to ask us to marry you, right? And she said, we're thinking if we just move in together, we can just test out the waters and see if we're good for one another. And she said, what does the Bible have to say? And I'm like, I'm so glad you asked what the Bible has to say, because you can't get mad at me because I didn't write it, okay? So I just opened up the Word of God, and I said, it's really, really clear in the Word of God. He says not to be living together, not to have sex together before you're married. So the next step, if you love somebody and you want to be together, is to get married. He doesn't say what the wedding has to look like. He doesn't say whether you got any money or not. None of that matters. All right? I didn't write it. Other people have said, man, I'm just really praying about the tithe. Like, I'm just asking God, is that something that you have for me? You don't need to ask God if the tithe is something for you. It's very, very clear, black and white. Go to Malachi. He tells you very Clearly, you don't give your tithe, you're robbing God. Some things are black and white. You're wasting your time to even ask. He already told you. It's like the mama who said, I don't need you asking again. I've already told you what to do, right? But then there's these gray areas. And these gray areas, it's, it's things like, God, do you want us to buy this house? God, do you want us to buy this car. God, do you want me to marry this person? They do love you with all of their heart. Guys, there's tons and tons of awesome believers out there, but there's only one that God created for you. All right? So you got to figure that out. Well, how do you know that? Here's what I want to teach you today. Jesus went into the garden of Gethsemane before he gave his life. Do you know what he prayed? He got down on his knees. He sweat, drops of blood because he was in so much agony. And he said this statement. He said, God, if there be any other way that we can save humanity, any other way that their sins could be forgiven, any other way that they could have a relationship reconciled with you, God, do that thing. But, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. When you begin to pray in those gray areas, you need to begin to pray this way, God, your will be done. So often we pray based on what we want. Look at this, James chapter 4. I'm going to go here real fast. James chapter 4, verse 2, it says this. Yet you don't... Well, calm down. <laughs> Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So often when we come to God, we're praying about what we want to happen. 
God, I really, man, I really, I love this guy. I really want to marry this guy. Lord, let that be your will. God, this new business adventure, God, it just seems like you've opened that door. I want to walk on through it. God, just bless it. How many of you ever just said, just bless it? I've had people ask me to pray that God would bless something that you knew straight up was sin. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I can't really pray about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah. You can go ahead. And this is always how I pray, okay? I don't want to offend. I hate confrontation. I always just say, bow your head. God, just let your will be done. I know he's not going to bless it, but I'm saying I did like, You know what I'm saying? That's not what I asked you to pray. <laughs> I said, God, give me that job. That's right. <laughs> but here's the thing. We got to learn how to turn those prayers around and pray it the right way to say, God, I don't know what your will is in this situation. Because, God, I can't see ahead of me. See, I can't see tomorrow, but God can. And sometimes the blocking is actually a blessing. If you're taking notes, write it down. Sometimes the blocking is actually a blessing. There's times in our life when we're about to make a really bad decision and God shuts the door. And in that moment, we're devastated. Tears are flowing. We're so mad. Temper tantrums flaring. And then we get down the road a little ways. And we turn around and we look back and we're like, boy, was I an idiot. Like, I had no idea what God had in store for me. I didn't realize that the guy I was about to marry was not the guy for me. And now I'm with that guy that God really had for me. And I can't even fathom the mistakes that I would have made had I said yes back then when I was young and stupid. You see, God sometimes will shut a door. And so this is how you need to pray. God, let your will be done. Lord, block me. If this is not your will, if this isn't the job for me, the person for me, the car for me, the outfit for me, I mean, I seriously, when I go shopping, I pray, God, let me get a good deal. And if it's not, I don't even want it. Like the perfect thing for me, I don't have time to be shopping. I don't care. Just want clothes in my closet that look good. Lord, let me go find them and find them fast. God cares about everything. All right? But so often we pray all about me. And we forget to actually ask him, God, what's your plan? Well, what do you think? Block me, Lord. Block me, Lord, if it's not your will. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? God, thank you for your word. God, thank you. You make it so black and white. God, thank you that there are times in our life, God, when you do choose to block us. And it is a blessing. You prevent us from making some really big mistakes in our life. God, so for that, we are thankful. And God, I pray right now, Lord, over each and every individual in this room and all of those watching online. God, we have all been hurt by people. We have been hurt by actions. God, I pray right now that you would help us to see that the unforgiveness that we're holding on to the pain of our past is blocking us from our future. God, I just pray right now, Father, over each and every person under the sound of my voice, God, that we would be able to just let go. This morning, if you're in this room and you're holding on to the pain of your past, I just want to encourage you, just open your hands and just say, Jesus, take it. I've held on to this junk long enough in my life. I've been blocked long enough. You can't go back and reverse what someone did to you. You can only choose how you're going to respond and how you're going to move forward. So God, I pray healing, Lord, over your children today. God, I pray that you would help us, God, in our relationships, in our marriage, God, Lord, to play our roles to fulfill the role and the calling you have upon our life. God, that our homes would be blessed, that our children would be blessed. God, that the world would look at us and see that covenant relationship that emulates you. God, I just pray right now, Father God, if there be anyone in this room today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today, I just want to ask you if you have a real relationship with Jesus. I'm not asking if you know God. I'm not asking if you believe in God. I'm asking you, do you have a relationship with Jesus? One that has changed your life. 
Because that's what God is extending to you today. He gave his one and only son to lay down his life so that your sins and my sins, the things we've done and said and thought that offended him because we don't measure up to his standard, those things that we've done, Jesus laid down his life to cover our sins and to give us the opportunity to have our relationship with God reconciled, to bring it back together. If you're here today and you would say, I don't have a real relationship. I mean, I know about God. I go to church. I'm here. But you don't have that relationship. Let me tell you something. You're never going to be fulfilled. You're never going to be happy. You're never going to be full of joy until you accept Jesus into your heart and you begin to live for him. So with eyes closed this morning, if that's you and you want to accept Jesus into your heart, you want a real relationship, one that will change your life and will impact your future, and your eternity. I want you to just throw your hands in the air. No one's looking around. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray with you in this place this morning. If that's you, just put your hand in the air this morning. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made. God, we thank you that you have given us abundant life. God, that our sins can be forgiven. Church, together, will you just pray this prayer with those who are making that decision right now? Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I know that I've disappointed you in the things I've said, things I've done, things I've even thought. Lord, I pray that I could honor you with my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That is the best prayer you will ever pray. And we have a gift to celebrate with you. This is called our Next Step Kit. It's in a green bag. Grab one as you exit on the left. Man, this has got a brand new Bible, one you can understand. And it's got a message from Brad and I helping you to know how you can be successful in this new walk. And if you're online and you prayed that prayer, will you just hit um, all in in the comments and then direct message us your address and one will be in the mail for you in the morning. Will you guys put your hands together for all of those today in the last two services who just prayed that prayer? Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.